She's so versatile. You know, it's kind of like she can do it all. That show could have never, ever gone on if it wasn't for Barbara. She was so energetic and fun, and she seemed to just be, like, embracing life. Oh, Master, I am so excited! So excited! There are people in the business who have a high likability quotient. She's one of those people. Generation after generation has grown up watching I Dream of Jeannie. If I'm going to be defined by a role, that's a nice one. It's a very good one, I think. She emerged from a 2,000-year-old bottle and a puff of smoke. She enchanted a straight-laced astronaut with a blink of an eye and a nod of her head. Yes, Master. Yeah. She had a sort of a magic about her, so that, that kind of gets in your head a little bit. You know? To play clean, wholesome, sexy is a tough one, and that's there with her. I love that show. I love Jeannie. Although known to millions as Jeannie, Barbara Eden's film stage and television career has spanned more than four decades. Barbara is an actress, a consummate actress. She's got it all. But behind the effervescent smile is a strong-willed woman who has overcome professional obstacles and personal heartbreak. In 2001, Barbara lost her only child, Matthew, to an accidental drug overdose. And apparently he had taken a hit of heroin. And he hadn't had it in, um, oh, quite a while, I guess a couple of years. It killed him. It stopped his heart. Barbara was never the same after her son's death, but somehow she found the courage to go on with her life. Born on August 23, 1934, in Tucson, Arizona, the baby girl who would one day be known to the world as Jeannie grew up in San Francisco, California, as Barbara Jean Huffman. Like so many Americans, the Huffmans struggled to make ends meet during the grueling years of the Great Depression. But they were determined to provide a stable and nurturing environment for their only child. Harrison Huffman was a loving father who worked long hours as a telephone lineman to make ends meet. And although Barbara's mother, Alice, was a strict disciplinarian, she possessed a lively sense of humor and upbeat attitude. My mom and dad were very much affected by the Depression. And of course, poor daddy, he didn't make a dime. He, he never, he worked so hard for very little. So we had a few rough times, but we always had fun. Sheltered by her protective parents, Barbara enjoyed a carefree childhood, often playing in Golden Gate Park with her mother and fishing with her father. The Huffman household was also filled with music and laughter, and singing was a ritual of daily life. We always had uh, records, uh, mostly classical. Um, and when we'd do the dishes, my mom would, uh, would harmonize with me and we'd, we'd sing. But by the age of seven, the sensitive girl's self-esteem plummeted. Her classmates teased her unmercifully when she was forced to wear an eye patch and thick glasses to correct a lazy eye. To coax Barbara out of her shell, Alice encouraged the child to focus on her singing. Barbara's confidence was slowly restored when she became a member of the church choir, and her angelic voice won her a throng of admirers. And uh, Alice said, Barbara, you have such a beautiful, pure voice that you should take lessons. Alice was Barbara's biggest supporter. And that's how Barbara started, with her mother's encouragement. Alice wanted Barbara to study at the prestigious San Francisco Conservatory. But by now, the Huffmans had a second daughter to support, and tuition was out of the question. When a family friend donated $100 for enrollment, the grateful teen dedicated herself to her lessons with unbridled enthusiasm and discipline. And my mother uh, heard me singing one day and said, Barbara, you know, you're singing every single note exactly where it ought to be, and you don't mean a thing you're singing. 
think you should study some acting. Taking her mother's advice to heart, Barbara joined an acting class, and to her surprise, found a fulfillment in acting she had never experienced in singing. In order to pay for her lessons, the ambitious 15-year-old high school student opted for what was known as the 4-4 plan, attending school four hours a day and working another four at a local bank. She really wasn't interested, I don't think, in the normal kid things. I think that she was mostly interested in just getting her drama lessons and working. After high school graduation, 17-year-old Barbara enrolled at San Francisco City College, where she soon became a much sought-after campus co-ed. When she was at high school, she was playing, and then all of a sudden she developed. And all of a sudden, people were looking at her differently than they did before. Encouraged by the newfound attention, in 1951, Barbara worked up the courage to enter the Miss San Francisco beauty pageant. Competition was stiff, but with her poise and wholesome good looks, she walked away with the crown and a bolstered sense of self-confidence. But Barbara was more interested in being an actress than a beauty queen, a desire her drama coach fully supported. She said, you either go down to Hollywood or you go to New York. But if you are really serious about this business, you'd better get started in doing it. Terrified by the prospect of leaving her tight-knit family, Barbara decided to give Hollywood a try and moved in with her mother's sister in San Marino, 16 miles from Los Angeles. The resourceful young woman immediately followed up on a family connection to a casting director at Warner Brothers. But she was unprepared for the studio executive's blunt assessment. He, uh told me that I was a very nice girl and very pretty little thing, he said, but you're not Hollywood pretty. He said, you just aren't gonna make it in this town. Though initially crushed by the rejection, Barbara left the lot determined to prove him wrong. If something comes along that frustrates Barbara, Barbara takes a look at it. She then says to herself, okay, this is a challenge. Let me see what I can do about this. Convinced she needed to be closer to the action, Barbara took a room at the Hollywood Studio Club. It was a safe haven for young actresses who pooled information on classes and auditions. She landed an agent whose first order of business was to find a more marketable name than Barbara Huffman. After choosing the last name Eden from a long list of marquee-friendly names, the agent strongly advised his client to capitalize on her curvaceous figure by auditioning in sexy dresses. Reluctantly agreeing to the strategy, Barbara soon secured guest spots on television shows such as Highway Patrol and Johnny Carson's Variety Series. But employment was intermittent, and the 22-year-old took the opportunity to hone her skills on the stage. The voice of the turtle was being done at the Laguna Playhouse, and I agreed to do it because I would never say no and Mark Robeson, who was directing at Fox at that time, saw me, and he had me come up to Fox for a, to read for a film he was doing. The film was Peyton Place, and though Barbara didn't win the role of Betty, 20th Century Fox was duly impressed and signed her to a seven-year contract. The aspiring actress who had been unceremoniously dismissed as not pretty enough by Warner Brothers was now a hot new property on the Fox lot. Wasting no time, the studio transformed the lovely ingenue into a screen siren in the style of Marilyn Monroe. Barbara's first assignment was a walk-on as a seductive secretary in the 1957 film Will success spoil Rock Hunter? Will success spoil Rock Hunter? Starring Tony Randall and Jane Mansfield. This is Miss Carstairs. She's new here. Good morning, Mr. Hunter. Good morning, Miss Costas. If you want anything, just call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The actress was loaned out to other studios for television appearances in episodes of Perry Mason and Bachelor Father. Patricia, how pretty you look. Hello, Bentley. Forgive the casual look. It took me two hours to achieve it. <laughs> The following year, 
Fox cast Barbara in the TV series adaptation of their hit film, How to Marry a Millionaire, about three bachelorettes looking for a rich husband. I'm Abner J. Doncourt. Hello. How do you do? Oh, and this is my secretary, Steve Chandler. How do you do? Barbara played the nearsighted gold digger Loco, a role originated by Hollywood's hottest sex symbol, Marilyn Monroe. No one could ever be Marilyn Monroe, visually or personality-wise, so I approached it differently. Being a person who's worn glasses since I was in the first grade, <laughs> I knew what it was to go around without them, and I decided that that would be my focal point with her character. How I love these fortune cookies. <laughs> Uh, that's fried shrimp. <laughs> oh! By 1957, Barbara had established herself as a working actress, and whenever she returned to San Francisco, the local press treated her like a star. How to Marry a Millionaire ended after two seasons, but Barbara Eden's career on the small screen was far from over. After the success of How to Marry a Millionaire, 25-year-old Barbara Eden began filming the musical comedy A Private's Affair, starring Sal Mineo, Terry Moore, and Gary Crosby. Hey, what's the idea of turning it off? Well, we're not going to hide in here like two lonely, defeated people, are we, when there's life to be lived outside? Hey, you got something there, Buster. Uh, how come a cute little chick like you joined the army? I didn't look good in a sack dress. Well, this will be the first time I ever danced with a sergeant. Barbara's hectic schedule left little time for a social life, but a studio executive was determined to play matchmaker. His choice? Actor Michael Ansara, known to television fans as Cochise in the hit series Broken Arrow. Are you a child that you thought peace would come easy? Go, track them and capture them. We'll turn them over to the military. The head of publicity there told Mike, there's a very nice girl in this next set and you should meet her. And Mike, uh, Mike's words were, I've got lots of girls, I don't need to meet another one. <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, I'm just working so hard. I don't, I don't think I want to meet anyone at this point. But when the two did meet, it was love at first sight. And six weeks later, on January 17th, 1958, Barbara Eden and Michael and Sarah were married. Michael was very solid, extremely intelligent, older, um, dependable, not, not a lot of malarkey, you know, he, when he said something, it was honest and true, and I could tell that. Not only was Barbara's personal life flourishing, so was her film career. The following year, the actress landed her first lead role in Flaming Star, opposite rock and roll sensation Elvis Presley. Barbara Eden, whose pale face beauty fired the conflict in Pater's soul. But you don't have to worry about it, I suppose. You'll always be safe from him. Now eager to display her range, Barbara accepted a supporting role in the sophisticated drama From the Terrace, starring Joanne Woodward and Paul Newman. Are you looking for me? I am if your name is Lex Porter. Well, my name is Clemmy Shree, but I'll be glad to change it if you'll stop looking further. Well, just how far am I allowed to look? <laughs> oh, your friends. But despite the high-caliber cast, the film was only a modest success. And over the next few years, Fox kept Barbara busy in a variety of films. In 1961, she appeared as a lieutenant on board a nuclear submarine in Irwin Allen's Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea with Walter Pidgeon and Joan Fontaine. You are there when Barbara Eden dances to Frankie Avalon's hot rhythms. You are there when the giant of the sea attacks. You are there in the most startling underwater pursuit ever built. Oh! Ah! Donald grabbed the anchor! 
The following year, Barbara portrayed a school marm swept up in an aerial adventure opposite Red Buttons and Peter Lorre in another Irwin Allen picture, Five Weeks in a Balloon. But in 1962, 20th Century Fox was facing financial ruin as the troubled production of their mega-budgeted film Cleopatra spun out of control. Fox reacted by selling off acres of prime real estate and releasing many of their contract players. Barbara Eden was forced to leave the studio that had been her home for the last seven years and her source of steady employment. Now freelancing, she took what she could get, returning to the small screen and guest starring roles on TV series such as The Andy Griffith Show and Rawhide, starring Clint Eastwood. In late 1964, Columbia Studios sent Barbara a TV pilot script written by Sidney Sheldon about a sexy genie and a handsome NASA astronaut. Sidney Sheldon did call me, and his first words were, I understand you're my genie. It was the easiest job I've ever gotten. But the good news was nearly scuttled by even more significant tidings when Barbara learned that she was pregnant. She was so thrilled, she and Mike both, about having this little baby that even Jeannie would have taken a back seat to this baby. I knew I had to tell Sydney quickly. And I said, I really have to talk to you right now. And Sydney facetiously sat down and said, you're pregnant. And I said, yes. <laughs> you know? He said, no. However, Sydney Sheldon was set on his genie and convinced the NBC brass to let Barbara begin filming as long as her condition didn't show. And on August 29, 1965, Barbara gave birth to a son, Matthew. Matthew was the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me in my life. I was awake when he was born, and, uh, and, the, and the doctor held him up, and it was just like a shot of electricity. You know, Just two weeks later, I Dream of Jeannie premiered on NBC. Featuring Bill Daly as Captain Roger Healy, Hayden Rourke as Dr. Bellows, and co-starring Larry Hagman as Captain Tony Nelson, an astronaut who, after crash landing on a deserted island, finds a very mysterious bottle. Jeannie, I wish you could speak English. Yaw, Shaw, hey, Parian. Somehow I must find a way to please thee, master. <laughs> you spoke English. Th that's all I had to do was say I wish. Thou may ask anything of thy slave, master. In 1965, the premise of a beautiful genie who moves in lock, stock, and bottle with her mortal master was considered highly risque. Uh, I tell you what, after I get a little rest, I'll pick you up and we'll go to dinner. <laughs> look, look who's here. Tony. I've always prided myself on being tolerant, but... Uh, would you explain to me, what is that girl doing here? Uh. <laughs> but Barbara's unique brand of mischievous, innocent sensuality made their cohabitation acceptable to television audiences. The quality to live in the house with him in the bottle and live together and still pull it off that it's nothing naughty going on is a great technique a great charm. A living genie who obeys her master's every command seemed to be a male fantasy come true. But the battle of the sexes repartee between the lead characters made the show equally popular with women. And it's that odd master genie relationship where she seems subservient to him but yet she has all the powers. So it's an interesting yin yang between the male female in this particular relationship. Well, you've got to get out of here right now, and I mean it. Oh, I'm happy here with thee. Oh, but Jeannie, Jeannie, I, I hate to do this, but I wish you'd have vanish. <laughs> where, where'd I go wrong? Thou hast set me free. That means that I'm free to please thee, and I'm going to please thee very much. Oh, no, no. At 31 years of age, Barbara appeared to have it all. A loving husband, a beautiful baby, and a hit television series. But while Jeannie could simply blink away her troubles, Barbara Eden 
would have to face hers head on. By 1967, graphic images of the bloody conflict in Vietnam dominated the airwaves. For many Americans, fantasy-based series like Batman, Bewitched, and I Dream of Jeannie provided a welcome escape. In its second season, I Dream of Jeannie was filmed in color and seen each week by more than 20 million viewers across the country. Although the chemistry between the ensemble cast was undeniable, Barbara remained the key to the show's success. That show could have never, ever gone on if it wasn't for Barbara. With anyone else, it couldn't happen. No one knows how brilliant that note is that she does. It, it was innocent, it was charming, it was lovely. Oh, Master, you were imagining things. Oh, please, may we go with Major Healy? Yes. Oh, All right. Oh, you're going to have a beautiful girl, very happy. But not until Saturday night. Saturday night, you won't forget this. Yeah, I won't forget this. Oh, Master, I am so excited. I'm so excited. Just think, we are going to a nightclub together. A nightclub. Oh, my goodness. I must go immediately to Paris and select my gown. She is a terrific median. She was so energetic and fun, and she seemed to just be, like, embracing life, basically. For her to be carefree and for him to be kind of uptight, I think that's where you get the comedy and the chemistry. Did you not enjoy yourself? How can you ask me that? Well, it is, it is very simple. Did you not have fun? You better come up with a very good explanation, young lady. Explanation? Yeah. For what? What have I done? Oh, all right. You're going to play that game with me? Go on, get in your bottle. Oh, 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 Master, you have no reason to be angry with me. I was angry with you, but I decided to forgive you. In 1967, Barbara was nominated for a Golden Globe as Best Female Star. She became even more popular when a line of genie merchandise flooded the market. By now, both Barbara and Michael were working steadily but they managed to make life at home their main priority. Barbara and Mike were family oriented. It was very important they enjoyed their home and they enjoyed their pool and, and their baby. Very important. Although she was now recognized everywhere she went, Barbara struggled to maintain a sense of normalcy for her son. He didn't like to share his mommy. And he shouldn't have to with other kids, you know? And we'd go to, for instance, Disneyland <laughs> and uh, I'd wear a red wig <laughs> so that people wouldn't recognize me <laughs> so I could take him on, you know, the rides and things and just be concentrated on him. The only problem with that is when I'd open my mouth, they'd know who I was. I didn't like it very much. There'd be people mobbing her. And that was difficult at times, you know. I, you know, I think I was jealous of the public. In an attempt to keep the show fresh, producers started casting major stars such as Sammy Davis Jr. and guest spots. Even Barbara's husband, Michael and Sarah, got into the act when he played the evil blue Jim. The producers also spiced up the series by allowing Barbara to play Jeannie's alter ego, her conniving and sexy twin sister. I don't know what your master is like, but mine's a drag. Oh, not my Major Nelson. He is a wonderful man. So this was Jeannie's dark side to have the sister come in from time to time and mix things up. But it gave you a chance to see Barbara Eden do something a little bit different than just be sweet little blinky Jeannie. <laughs> I'm so happy to finally see you. Well, what's gotten into you, anyway? Oh, nothing. Uh, don't I always kiss you when you come home at night? Yeah, well, not that way. <laughs> what a waste. But despite their efforts to keep the show contemporary, I Dream of Jeannie grew increasingly dated. Film actresses like Jane Fonda and Raquel Welch were shocking audiences with overt sexuality and revealing costumes while Barbara's modestly constructed harem outfit exposed little more than a portion of her bare midriff. And in 1969, what appeared to be an innocent invitation for Barbara to appear on Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In turned into a full-blown controversy. The show's producers had decided it was time to unveil Barbara's never-before-seen navel to the American public.
And uh, NBC, suddenly, who had never even thought about it before, went, no, no, her navel will never be seen, you know. But I understand they had a meeting with all the suits, and all they talked about was my belly button. NBC won the war, and Barbara's navel remained coyly concealed. And by the fifth season, the premise of Jeannie and Captain Nelson's unconsummated love affair had played itself out. The sexual tension that had fueled the long-running series ended when Jeannie finally married her master. Much to Barbara's dismay, I Dream of Jeannie was canceled in 1970. I was very depressed when the show was canceled. Very depressed. It's, uh, it's a big change and shock to your system. These are the people you spend most of your life with. And uh, it's very depressing. And you never see them again exactly that way. By 1971, Barbara was working steadily in a string of highly rated TV movies, including The Feminist and the Fuzz, a comedy co-starring David Hartman, and The Stranger Within, a dark melodrama. She's one of those sitcom actresses that made the leap, became a marketable TV movie personality at a time when the TV movies were very hot. Just having Barbara Eden in the TV movie usually meant you could get a lot of eyeballs to the TV set. Barbara was eager to expand her growing repertoire and began preparing a nightclub act that would showcase the singing talent which had been all but ignored by Hollywood. In the midst of all this activity, Barbara was overjoyed to learn that she was pregnant once again. But in her seventh month, tragedy struck when doctors delivered the heart-wrenching news that the unborn baby had died. Barbara's obstetrician advised her to carry the child for an additional two months before labor could be induced. I think there's a period of time that they cannot take the child from you because it endangers a mother's life. I don't know how she carried that child for two months knowing that it was dead and the people coming up to her and saying, oh, I'm so happy for you. And Barbara's knowing that the child is dead. I just don't know how she did it. The anguish that both Barbara and Michael suffered during the previous months caused tension in their 13-year marriage and the relationship started to unravel. As Barbara spiraled into a deep depression, she struggled to put the tragedy behind her. But more heartache lay just around the corner. In 1972, 38-year-old Barbara Eden slowly emerged from the depression that had plagued her since the death of her child and focused on her upcoming nightclub engagement. How she got through, I don't know, but I think in some ways it was a blessing that we had dates, we had rehearsals, and she had to show up. Capitalizing on her little-known talent as a songstress, Barbara impressed audiences with her one-woman show in Las Vegas. performed everything from energetic pop tunes to bluesy ballads. She's so versatile. You know, it's kind of like she can do it all. And I think people lose sight of the fact that she has so many gifts. I want a Sunday kind of love. Although she had managed to hold her career together, Barbara's relationship with her husband had reached an impasse. In 1973, after 15 years of marriage, she and Michael divorced. I think that she was very upset about the divorce and heartbroken and mostly concerned about her son. 
she had always wanted just a happy marriage and a home life. Refusing to dwell on the past, Barbara took her nightclub act on the road. While in Chicago, she was courted by newspaper executive Chuck Feggert. If Michael and Sarah was kind of the stoic, kind of solid introvert, Chuck Feggert was the exact opposite. He was the guy that wanted to have a good time and do things and go places. Barbara fell in love with the gregarious Feggert and for the next four years divided her time between the Windy City and Los Angeles. But in 1976, her adolescent son announced that he wanted to live with his father. Barbara was devastated by Matthew's departure. Horrible. <laughs> that was horrible. But, uh, you know, it was the best thing for Matt at that time. I guess we all thought. Barbara married Chuck on September 11, 1977. And although she now resided primarily in Chicago, the actress had no intention of slowing down. She made her first foray into the world of independent film in a movie based on the popular tune Harper Valley PTA. Nobody expected it to be as successful as it was, and we took the picture out and opened it in different areas, and it just caught on, and it became the sleeper hit of that year. When NBC created a series based on Harper Valley PTA, they asked Barbara to reprise her role as Stella Johnson, a brassy small-town single mother who shocks the locals with her free-spirited attitudes. You know it's the truth, and I know it's the truth. But the PTA board has their own kind of truth. What are you going to do about it? I don't know. I don't know. They can take me off the committee, but they can't keep me from working the carnival. Bingo. I thought we kicked her off the committee. Well, we did, but we can't stop her from working in the booth. Five dollars, please. Harper Valley was a rating success, but when the executive producer, Sherwood Schwartz, left at the end of the first season, the show began to flounder. And in its second season, the series went through a succession of producers and writers. It was very difficult for Barbara because she still had to finish her commitment and get up and knowing that the show was going down the tube. And I think that NBC really respected the fact that Barbara didn't put any blame on anybody and criticize anybody. Barbara in general deals with life's uh, challenges in a very interesting way. Barbara's a very positive person. And by that, I don't mean to say that she, she doesn't look at what's negative, but she deals with the negative, and she brings it up to a positive level. But despite Barbara's best efforts, Harper Valley PTA was canceled. And by now, the differences in Barbara and Chuck's lifestyles could no longer be ignored. You know, everybody gets confused in life and thinks they want different things, and, and they make certain decisions, and sometimes they make bad decisions. And I think my mom made a bad decision. In 1982, the couple filed for divorce and Barbara moved back to Beverly Hills. There she seized the opportunity to spend more time with her 18-year-old son, Matthew, who was now attending junior college. But Barbara was about to make a startling discovery. He wasn't going to school. And um, he had lied to me, and he never lied. Never. I knew something was horribly, horribly wrong. I was just dropping my classes and I was just doing drugs constantly. I mean, it was morning till night. I had never left the room. I think I turned to drug use because it just numbed me out. You know, I didn't have to feel. I know it killed my mom. Although she was shattered and terrified by the revelation, Barbara took action and immediately sought expert advice. I'd gone to Al-Anon meetings and uh, I had a little counseling myself to find out how to cope with this. I learned you can't get them well they have to do it themselves but at least you can offer the opportunity and all you can do is keep offering it but it was hard it was hard for him it's hard for me hard for his father as she had so often before the 51 year old actress sought solace in her work in 1985 she returned to the role that had made her famous and starred in I Dream of Jeannie 15 years later but when Larry Hagman was unavailable to reprise his role 
Wayne Rogers stepped in as Major Anthony Nelson. I think she enjoyed coming back to it. She's nobody's fool, and she knows exactly what she's about. So she did it because she was having fun. Barbara's always been proud of the fact that she had a series that brought a lot of happiness and joy to people over the years. And so uh, rather than reject it, she's embraced it. Barbara slipped back into her harem costume, this time with her navel in full view, and Bill Daly returned to his role as Roger Healy. I was doing a scene, and Barbara came out, and she had, God, this is the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. She had the unit, the same outfit, and she looked the same. And I, I really couldn't go on. I just kind of took my breath and went, wow. The TV movie earned high ratings, proving the ageless beauty's immense appeal. And although Barbara Eden had endured a series of professional and personal heartaches, in the eyes of the American public, she was forever the sprightly and youthful genie. <coughs> Following the success of her 1985 return to TV as everyone's favorite genie, Barbara continued to face challenges in her personal life. She was still struggling with her son's drug addiction, and her mother, Alice, was diagnosed with inoperable lung cancer caused by years of smoking. I learned everything from my mother. Um, she was a very, very wise woman. I didn't always listen to her, but I'd always find out she was right, <laughs> and then I'd tell her, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, I, I have a lot to thank my mother for. Barbara took on the role of caretaker until her mother's death the following year. As a result, she became actively involved with the wellness community, a support program for cancer patients. In 1989, Barbara's life took an unexpected turn when she was set up on a blind date with contractor John I. Schultz, probably the only American male over the age of 21 who didn't know who she was. I did see a rerun of I Dream of Jeannie before we had a date, so I at least knew what she looked like. I saw that and I said, yes, I do want a date with that lady. On January 5, 1991, after a two-year courtship, the couple was married in Barbara's hometown of San Francisco. He's a good guy. Um, he cares about my mom a lot. I feel comfortable with uh, them being married. I know he'd do anything for her. Barbara's the love of my life. I didn't realize that a relationship as strong as, as we have been able to develop and enjoy was possible. She's the most important thing that's happened to me. With John, Barbara could settle into the stable domestic life she loved, filled with family and friends. They are a very loving couple. They're great together. And they're best friends. And that's the most important thing. The couple traveled as much as possible, experiencing new worlds and new cultures. Barbara's constantly reading. Barbara loves history. And I think that's where her love of travel to go and see the places that she's read about comes from. Throughout the decade, Barbara continued working on the small screen, appearing in more than a dozen made-for-television movies and yet another genie installment. And in 1993, she won critical praise for her dramatic portrayal of a therapist with psychic powers and visions of murder. I'm seeing things that are real, Hal, things that are actually happening. It could mean Gloria Hager's body is in the bay. I saw Hager dump something in the bay. It, it could have been a body. And it could be your imagination. Gloria was frightened of him. She said that sometimes he lost control. Hey, we all lose control sometimes, including you. It doesn't make us criminals. They have a child, Hal. What's that supposed to mean? It means that if I'm right, at this moment, that little girl is living with a killer. Barbara also earned rave reviews in 1995 for her role as a vixen in the play Nightclub Confidential, a glitzy musical spoofing cabarets of the 1950s. I would sit out in the audience and 
she'd start singing and I'd hear people say, I didn't know she could sing. She has a wonderful voice. They just never think of Barbara having a voice. They think of Jeannie. Since its cancellation in 1970, I Dream of Jeannie has continued to run throughout the world in syndication. And in 1994, the series premiered on the youth-oriented Nick at Night cable station, introducing Jeannie to a whole new audience. What's interesting, though, is a lot of shows, and Jeannie is one of them, might not have been a big cultural icon at the time, but by being seen every day by new generations of people, the show's legend begins to build and build by repeated exposure. You know, she's been on the air for more than 30 years without an interruption. Generation after generation has grown up watching I Dream of Jeannie. In 1998, there was yet another resurgence in Barbara's popularity. Fast. When the star appeared as Jeannie in a very creative ad campaign. Oh, oh, oh. This will never do. Whoa. Introducing the first luxury SUV that doesn't ride like a truck. The RX 300, like no other vehicle or value on Earth. <laughs> well, hello there. <laughs> you know, actors are always defined by one role, it seems. And if I'm going to be defined by a role, that's a nice one. It's a very good one, I think. <laughs> But to Barbara, her most important role was that of a parent. And in 2001, Barbara experienced a mother's worst nightmare when Matthew was found dead in his car, the victim of an accidental heroin overdose. In an interview with Good Morning America, only eight months after her son's death, Barbara was shown a clip of this A&E biography where Matthew made a now chilling statement. My mother never seemed to lose hope in me. She always had a belief in me when I didn't have belief in myself. I mean, I feel like she saved my life. He'd been away from it for a while. Uh, the police told me that probably... Uh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, probably he wasn't aware that there was stronger stuff out there. Mm. And that's what killed him. It was painful for Barbara to look back at Matthew and hear how grateful he was for her support during his lifelong battle with drugs. He knew he hadn't beaten it. He knew he was winning. The best thing for Matthew was AA. Um, and it was the last, I guess, seven to eight years that he's been wanting to be clean and sober. The last two or three years, he was. And it was, it was a joy. He was just a different human being. Unfortunately, Matthew's sobriety didn't last and his death left Barbara with a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, Matthew had a frame of reference with his mom, his, his mom and dad. He knew that, uh, that we didn't use drugs, we didn't over drink. Um, he knew that. I guess there are hundreds of things I would have changed in my life, but you can't worry about what's in the past. Just go forward. And that's exactly what Barbara did. After her son's death, Barbara threw herself back into acting. From guest starring roles on Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Lifetime's hit series Army Wives, and the Hallmark Channel's Always and Forever, she has kept busy over the years. But it was her on-stage reunion with former co-star Larry Hagman for the play Love Letters that brought her acting career full circle. Although she has embraced the mystical character that has made her world famous. Well, yes, Master, I am going. It is Barbara Eden's down-to-earth personality and optimism that have brought magic into the lives of those closest to her. There are people in the business who have a high likability quotient. She's one of those people. I think everybody loves Barbara. Barbara's a very special person. She's a very giving person, a very unselfish person. There's little or nothing about her not to like. It is your sister, Jeannie! <laughs> She's just my sister. And she always will be. <laughs> People always say, oh, well, Jeannie is, you know, does she really cross her arms and blink? And I say, yes, she does. She is Jeannie. <laughs> it's a hit with kids everywhere. <laughs> hot, hot, burn. Rango, rated PG. <laughs>